Hi, afternoon everybody. Um, I'm going to talk today about weaning and extubation and liberating patients from, venti from mechanical ventilation. Just bear in mind that this talk specifically is directed towards patients who have endotracheal tubes rather than tracheostomies. Some of the similarities, there are still some similarities when you're trying to get a patient off a ventilator, but a lot of the subtleties may be a little bit different when you have a patient long-term ventilation and a tracheostomy rather than a translaryngeal intubation. Okay, so I want to stop, Whoa. hang on, Dave's not, wait a minute, there we go, okay. So I just want to start off with a, a couple of definitions, which is kind of semantics, but it's still important when, when we're talking about specifics with um, extubating a patient um, in the ICU. So we often talk about weaning the patient from the ventilator. And what we mean by weaning is when we gradually reduce the ventilator support, and at the same time, the patient starts to resume their own spontaneous ventilation. Now, the very terminology weaning suggests that it's a gradual reduction in support. Um, and if we're going to be particularly picky about semantics, then we actually don't want to gradually reduce support anymore. And the term weaning is no longer recommended. So what we talk about is discontinuation of mechanical ventilation and liberation from the ventilator. So if you want the correct terminology, we talk about liberation and discontinuation. And the reason we no longer describe it as weaning is really because of this very important paper that's 25 years old now um, by Andries Esteban, published in the NEJM. And what he did was he described four weaning um, techniques from mechanical ventilation. He looked at, he, he performed, the patients were divided into four subgroups, one, one of whom went underwent intermittent mandatory ventilation and weaning, which I'll describe in a little bit more. The other group had pressure support ventilation, the third group had intermittent spontaneous breathing trials, and the fourth group had daily spontaneous breathing trials. So with the first group who had a, an intermittent mandatory ventilation, so they were getting a set number of breaths um, per minute. And the weaning in this group was a gradual reduction in breath rate. They turned the breath rate down two or three breaths every so often to see if they could get the patient off the ventilator. The group who had pressure support ventilation, so they were breathing spontaneously and triggering the ventilator, but um, would get, each breath was supported. And in order to try and wean these patients, they had a gradual reduction in pressure support until the patient was eventually breathing on their own. So you can see the first two techniques had the, the weaning with the gradual reduction. One group was subjected to intermittent spontaneous breathing trials where they were given um, spontaneous breathing for two or more times a day, gradually increasing the duration of the spontaneous ventilation until the patient could manage two hours of spontaneous ventilation. And then finally, the one group had a daily spontaneous breathing trial where they were put on a T-piece um, to see how they could cope um, with a, a complete reduction of um, removing them completely from mechanical ventilation. And the important finding with this technique is that the spontaneous breathing trials both resulted in twice as quick, sorry, beg your pardon, compared to intermittent mandatory ventilation, the spontaneous breathing trials um, liberated the patients three times faster off the ventilator and twice as quickly with the, the gradual reduction in, in pressure support. So quite clearly, patients were liberated from the ventilator much faster when they were going, when they were um, subjected to a spontaneous breathing trial rather than gradual reduction or weaning in ventilation. So weaning doesn't work, it just takes too long. And what we want is to discontinue or liberate as soon as possible using spontaneous breathing trials. I'm sure you're well aware now, most of you spent a few weeks in ICU, that delaying extubation is a costly business. Not only does it increase the need of ICU length of stay and therefore cost, it's also costly to the patient in terms of infection, increase in lung injury, um, and increased need for sedation and stay in ICU. Delaying extubation and prolonging the time on a ventilator is associated with an increase in mortality. In actual fact, prolonged weaning and extubation are both independent risk factors of one-year mortality. So yes, it becomes um, quite apparent that we want to discontinue or liberate the patient from mechanical ventilation as soon as possible. 
but obviously not too soon. And what I mean by that is because if you are very aggressive in, in extubating a patient, um, you are going to get a, um, an increase in, in failed extubation where the patient needs to be re-intubated. And this is also not good for the patient because they can, this obviously if they, if they fail at extubation, the patient can lose their airway, they can lose their protective reflexes, which may increase the risk of pulmonary aspiration. They'll have periods of suboptimal gas exchange and may get inspiratory muscle overload and fatigue. So failed extubation and reintubation also imposes a, a stress on the cardiovascular system with sympathetic stimulation. And the patients who fail extubation and need to be reintubated have an eight times increased risk of nosocomial pneumonia and a six to eight times increased risk of mortality. So it's important to strike a fair balance between extubating the patient as soon as you possibly can, but not um, subjecting the patient to the stresses around a failed extubation and the, and the requirement for re-intubation. You have to realize though, that it is important to have some re-intubation re rate in your ICU, because if you extubate everybody very late and you have zero re-intubation rate, then you're probably too, um, uh, too conservative in your extubation strategy. But if you have a re-intubation rate of 25% or above, then you're probably too aggressive in your re-intubation, I beg your pardon, in your extubation strategy. So you, the idea is to aim for, a, in your ICU, a re-intubation rate between 5 and 15%, which is acceptable. Um, this gentleman is, is um, John Cress, who's very well, um, very famous in, in the world of sedation and weaning from mechanical ventilation. Um, and he was quoted as saying from a Congress that, that I attended where he was lecturing, that if your objective is never to have to be to reintubate a patient, then you are in the wrong business. As I said, it's important to have some um, reintubation rate in your ICU, other you're, otherwise you're just not aggressive enough in trying to liberate the patient from mechanical ventilation. So when do you know that the time is right to extubate your patient and liberate them from the ventilator? So the three main questions that you need to ask before deciding whether or not you can extubate the patient. The first one is the indication for ventilation or, or, or intubation, which may be different. Has that intub the, the initial indication that put the patient on the ventilator, has that improved? Is there some clinical improvement for the reason they needed to be on the ventilator? The second question is, regarding the mechanical ventilation part of, of, um, of, of our question, can the patient breathe spontaneously? And are the lung mechanics and gas exchange acceptable? And then the third question is separate from the need for mechanical ventilation, but they may still need the endotracheal tube. And can the patient protect their own airway? And is the bulbar function, cough and GCS adequate? So let's look at these questions a little bit more closely. So question one, the initial indication that the patient ended up on a, an, with an endotracheal tube on mechanical ventilation. Has that improved? So you need to divorce in your mind the difference between the need for intubation and the need for mechanical ventilation. And they can often be different. For example, a patient may need to be intubated if they have a depressed level of consciousness, but their ventilatory capacity may be acceptable. Whereas conversely, a patient may need mechanical ventilation. And in order to facilitate that, they have to be intubated. So has the disease improved? The respiratory indication, for example, in pneumonia, it doesn't have to have gone away completely, but is there clinical improvement? If they were intubated for a low yes, has that improved to a, um, a, a, um, a level by where they can protect their own airway? Does a patient have cardiac, cardiac failure because some patients need to be intubated and ventilated for cardiac failure and any peripheral weakness that may or, or central weakness that may have needed necessitated ventilation, has that also improved? Now the problem is it can be quite tricky to with some of these um, indications and mostly it relies on, on clinical judgment and we tend to use surrogate markers of disease reversal. But you have to still ask this question, is, is there some resolution um, clinically? So only if the disease is improving, then we can move on. So question two is what about the need for the ventilator? Does the patient need the ventilator anymore? And in order to decide whether or not the patient doesn't need the ventilator, they need to be able to breathe spontaneously 
and at the same time have acceptable lung mechanics and gas exchange. And probably the best way in order to assess these things is to perform a spontaneous breathing trial. Now let's look a little bit more closely at the spontaneous breathing trial before we progress with our questions. So a spontaneous breathing trial is where the patient breathes spontaneously with minimal support from the ventilator. And it establishes whether or not mechanical ventilation can potentially be discontinued. And I say potentially discontinued because there may be other reasons why the patient needs to be intubated um, rather than just the need for mechanical ventilation. So the spontaneous breathing trial is probably the best way to assess whether or not there is continued need for positive pressure ventilation. So there are a few ways which we can do it that are described in the literature. The first is a T-piece trial, um, which is quite simple, where you just take the patient off the ventilator, allow them to breathe spontaneously on a T-piece whilst providing humidified oxygen to the patient. The second technique is to, where you set the ventilator with, with effective CPAP, where the, C, the, the PEEP is just set at the, at the equivalent rate of the last, um, the last setting of PEEP, usually at a maximum of about five centimeters of water, but the patient is given no pressure support. And the final technique is one that we do most commonly in the ICU, is where we set the pressure support of about five to eight centimeters of water above PEEP, um, at, yeah, five to eight centimeters of water above PEEP and a maximum pressure of about five centimeters of, of PEEP. So you can see that the patient here gets low level of assistance. Um, some fancy ventilators have an automated tube compensation, which also compensates for the resistance in the endotracheal tube. So the question is, what's best? Well, TP's trial, yes, it it's, gives humidified oxygen and probably mimics the, the conditions that are closest to when the patient is off the ventilator. It has the highest specificity for predicting success from, from um, liberation from the ventilation, but a poor sensitivity. It's not quite the same as we would have um, when, when we're in healthy patients because our vocal cords to some extent do allow us some peep um, during health or times when you don't have an endotracheal tube through your, through your vocal cords. So it's not quite mimicking um, normal natural conditions, but it's, it's probably closer than the other two. People often think that, that if you've got a patient who's borderline from um, extubation and liberation, then maybe a T-piece trial is the best because you're pretty guaranteed that if they can pass on a T-piece where they're working quite hard, then they should be able to pass once, once extubated. If you provide some peak, plus or minus low levels of pressure support, then this gives you more sensitivity um, for predicting um, success from liberation. Um, but there is some modification of inspiratory muscle effort, and it may be misleading because the patient may cope um, with a little bit of additional pressure support, but um, may not actually um, cope once they're extubated. So it may be a little bit misleading you into false sense of security where the patient looks a little bit better than they really are. However, nevertheless, the recent guidelines from, um, the, from 2017 do suggest that you don't just put the patient on CPAP, that you have some peak of about five with pressure support of five to eight centimeters of water. Um, it does give the patient a little bit of extra support, but it also helps overcome any resistance from the endotracheal tube and the ventilator circuit. If you set that these kind of settings when you do a spontaneous breathing trial in your patient, it results in more patients being liberated from ventilation. From ventilation. Um, and in actual fact, although we used to be concerned that it may give you a false sense of security about your patient and there may be an increased risk for, of failure, um, there is actually, it doesn't, it's not associated with an increase in reintubation rate and actually shows a better short-term mortality. Um, so the recommendations at the moment Put your patient on, on the ventilator, PEEP of five, pressure supported between five and eight, and this is the preferred method for performing a spontaneous breathing trial. Try not to do spontaneous breathing trials when patients are receiving higher FiO2s than 40%. As I mentioned, what we normally do is a PEEP of five and a pressure support of seven to eight. And it's important not to do the spontaneous breathing trial for, for the too short a period or too long a period. The patient should be able to cope on a spontaneous breathing trial for at least 30 minutes, but for no longer than two hours. There's nothing to be gained by pushing your patient on a spontaneous breathing trial beyond two hours. Um, and in order to get a fair representation of whether or not they'll be cope, 
able to cope once liberated, you should continue for at least 30 minutes. But please remember, if there's any sign at all that the patient is failing the spontaneous breathing trial, then don't push on for the 30 minutes or wait for two hours. Please stop the spontaneous breathing trial and recommence full ventilation if the patient is showing signs of failing. So there's several reasons why the patient may, may fail, fail a spontaneous breathing trial and try not to look at any in isolation. Look at the whole clinical picture for the patient. But the, um, the much purported um, indications for failing are as follows. A respiratory rate is if the patient's very tachypneic or bradypneic or the respiratory rate is changed by more than 50% after the spontaneous breathing trial. If the patient becomes hemodynamically unstable, either from a blood pressure or a, or a um, heart rate perspective. Um, and just think about the need for vasoactive agents. Low dose vasoactive agents are not a, a, a contraindication to, to a spontaneous breathing trial. Um, but if they suddenly need vasoactive uh, vasopressors during it, then it may well be a good indication that they're failing the spontaneous breathing trial. The patient should have an adequate gas exchange with an adequate PF ratio. Their SATs should be above 80 to 5 to 90% with uh, maintaining a good pH and not becoming hypercarbic. Restlessness and agitation may also be a, quite a subtle sign that the patient's failing a spontaneous breathing trial, as is a change in mental status, discomfort as, as, um, as, as, as communicated by the patient, and again, diaphoresis and sweating. This can be quite um, a, an important um, indicator that the patient's failing a spontaneous breathing trial and often gets missed but if you see that the patient's otherwise comfortable, but he's breaking out in beads of sweat, then just be a little bit um, uh, mindful of the fact that they're probably having an increase in sympathetic stimulation and may not be ready to um, be liberated from the ventilator. And then quite obviously increased work of, of, of breathing where the patients have a thoracic abdominal paradox or are using their accessory, accessory muscles. Remember, it's important, don't use a single parameter in isolation, rather use a composite and look at the patient as a whole, rather than just one, um, one pointer of the, that they may be failing the spontaneous breathing trial. Okay, the next bit is to look at the ABCs. Do you know your alphabet? And this is an important study, again, 10 or more years old now, the Awakening and Breathing Control trial published in The Lancet. And what this trial did was it paired a daily breathing, a spontaneous breathing trial with daily awakening. So every day the patient was given a spontaneous breathing trial and their sedation was stopped. And when you pair the two together, the patients are extubated three days earlier than if you do one or the other, and they're discharged sooner from ICU and hospital when you pair both awakening and, breathe, and, and spontaneous breathing. And amazingly enough, the paired study, paired, um, awakening with the spontaneous breathing trial actually reduced the mortality at one year. Um, yes, it did increase the number of patients who, who self-extubated because now they're a little bit more awake and maybe a little bit more restless, but it didn't, but although the more patients in the paired group um, had a, an increase in self-extubation, it didn't translate to an increase in, in re-intubation rate. So it was probably appropriate that the patient was extubated when they, they chose to self-extubate. More recent evidence looked at pairing of spontaneous awakening with spontaneous breathing trials. And this was also shown um, in the Klumper study that there was a reduction in ventilator associated events, a reduction in duration of ventilation, a reduction in ICU length of stay, and a reduction in hospital length of stay. So now the patient has had a spontaneous breathing trial and they've passed the spontaneous breathing trial. The next question though is, do they still need to be mechanically ventilated? because a spontaneous breathing trial in its own right is just not enough to say whether or not the ventilator is still required. And probably a very important predictor as to whether or not the patient does still need the ventilator is the rapid shallow breathing index. A very old test, 30 years old now, um, but still has nevertheless stood the test of time. So the RSBI, as we call the rapid shallow breathing index, is calculated by the patient's spontaneous respiratory rate divided by the tidal volume in liters. It's pointless assessing a rapid shallow breathing index when the patient is getting mechanically ventilated. You have to do it when they're getting their spontaneous breathing trial. And it's a very useful tool in predicting extubation success. And the, the number that you want to achieve when you calculate your RSBI 
is a number less than or equal to 105. And that is the number that's most likely to predict the likelihood of successful weaning. It's also known as a Tobin number. And it's assessed as, as um, when you assess the patient over a one minute time period, calculating the, um, the average tidal volume and their spontaneous respiratory rate. Um, a number less than 105 should tell you that the patient would have um, successful extubation. It's important not to use it in isolation. You have to look at the patient again as a whole. None of these indices or these tests should be used just in isolation. But the rapid shallow breathing index is the best, best tool that we have to assess readiness for discontinuation of ventilation. Importantly, you have to distinguish in your mind the need for ventilation and the need for the endotracheal tube. So the RSBI will tell you whether or not the patient needs to be ventilated, but it doesn't tell you whether or not the patient still needs the endotracheal tube, which I'll come to in a moment. So although we use a Tobin number of 105, just an easy way to remember it is if the patient's respiratory RSBI is greater than 100, then you probably shouldn't be extubating the patient or discontinuing ventilation. If it's between 80 to 100, you can continue with caution. And if it's less than 80, then there's an excellent chance that the patient is ready for discontinuation from the ventilation. Okay, question three, what about the need for an artificial airway and the endotracheal tube? Okay, so there's several things we can look at when it comes to assessing whether or not the patient needs an endotracheal tube. And they're listed here and I'm gonna go through them um, individually. What about, is the patient able to protect their airway from secretions? So, an important thing to think about is if the patient can protect from the airway is whether or not they have a good cough. Now, we can only really assess this with a, a surrogate marker in the ICU. And for this, we ask the patient to do a forced vital capacity. Now, people will always quote you saying, oh, we, all, we just need the patient to be able to blow a VC of over a litre. Now, the number of a, a litre comes from your bog standard patient of 70 kilos in the ICU, having a tolerable limit of vital capacity of 15 mils per kilo. So that works out at about a, a, um, hundred, a, a liter for your, for your average patient. You have to realize that this is the limit that we'll tolerate. Our normal vital capacity is between 50 to 70 mils per kilo. So what we're accepting as a marker for extubation is way below what is normal for a patient. It also tells you something about if you get the patient to blow a vital capacity, it does tell you a little bit about their level of consciousness as well, because in order, to, in order for them to cooperate with you and, and do a proper vital capacity, then you need an alert and cooperative patient. It's important to realize as well that although we talk about vital capacity in terms of mils per kilogram, the vital capacity often really correlates better with height than with weight. So if if you have a very tall patient who might be quite skinny and has a, but still has a low vital capacity, then they may be less likely to, co to cope than a shorter patient um, of a similar weight. The other important thing about thinking about can the patient um, protect their airway from secretions is do they have minimal secretions? And the um, literature definition of that is if they need suctioning less frequently than every two hours. Um, it's an important thing because we've often seen patients who are very awake and very have a, a good VC, but when they're pouring secretions, they just cannot keep up with the, with the need for suctioning and still need artificial airway. And then the other thing is, can they cough and can they actually swallow their secretions? If they've got poor bulbar function, then they won't swallow their secretions or they may aspirate on, on, um, on their, their, their um, tracheal secretions. And then that can also lead to problems with um, ongoing aspiration. Okay, can the patient obey commands? I've already said that if you can get them to blow VC, then there's a very good chance that they, that they can blow, uh, 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 obey commands. And the ability of a patient to obey commands greatly improves the chance of successful extubation. Although obviously it's not always possible if you're dealing with patients who have um, low-ish Glasgow Coma scores. Okay, what about muscle strength and an empty stomach? I'll deal with these on the same slide. So muscle strength, we're not only talking about peripheral weakness, bulbar weakness is also important. Um, can the patient swallow the secretions or are there, are there, are there secretions, are they just pooling and are they at risk of aspiration? Peripheral weakness, probably the best way to assess this in a patient in readiness for extubation 
is to see if they can perform a sustained head lift. You get them to lift the head off the pillow, and if this is, is sustained, then it definitely increases the risk of a successful extubation and improves the ability to swallow secretions. When it comes to whether or not the patient should have an empty stomach, remember that all these patients are obviously mostly on nasogastric feeds, and we should be stopping nasogastric feeds for more than four hours before extubation um, and liberation. And the, feet, the nasogastric tube should be put on drainage and suction. If the patient's receiving nasogeginal feed, then you don't actually need to stop them before you extubate the patient. Pyrexia and ease of re replacing the airway. Pyrexia is not often mentioned in the literature, but remember the pyrexial patient has increased metabolic requirements and increased oxygen demand. And if you're just liberating them from the ventilator where they've been oxygen dependent, then they may be likely to fail if they've got a rising pyrexia. I've been caught out a couple of times in the patient who passes um, in a, any, any other way, every other way that I've assessed, but if they've got a temperature that's, that's starting to rise, then often then they sometimes fail and you can be caught out by these kind of patients. Difficulty in replacing the airway, again, is not always often talked about in the literature, but if you have a borderline extubation um, where the patient may have a difficult airway, then it's probably prudent to wait until um, you have a um, kind of in office hours where there are more people around to help should the patient need to be reintubated. Don't go gung ho and extubate the patient who's got a very difficult airway um, just because you felt like doing a spontaneous breathing trial late at night. And then finally, um, a little subject on its own, but the, consider the, the, um, in the likelihood of the patient developing post extubation stridor. Many patients are at increased risk of post extubation stridor, particularly if they've been ventilated for more than six days. Women are more at risk, as are trauma patients and trauma patients who've had a traumatic or repeated intubation. The use of larger endotracheal tubes is associated with an increased risk of post extubation stridor, and as is previous um, need for reintubation after the patient's failed extubation. So, what the recommendation is that is before that you before you um, extubate the patient, then in, if the patient has one of these risk factors, then consider performing a cuff leak test. Now, what the cuff leak test is, is it's a procedure that will detect air, airflow around an artificial airway. So after suctioning the oropharynx, you slowly, gently deflate the cuff of the endotracheal tube. And then on the ventilator, you can actually set the ventilator to measure your in, in, inhaled and exhaled um, volumes. If the difference between the inhaled tidal volume and the exhaled tidal volume is more than 110 mils, then there's a very good chance that the patient, um, so if it's more than 110 mils, then there's a very good chance that there's, that there's a sufficient leak around the airway and that the patient won't develop post-extubation stridor. If the difference between the two is less than 110 mils, then it implies that the, the endotracheal tube is quite a snug fit and the patient may have some, um, some uh, mucosal edema in the trachea, so they're more likely to fail a cuff leak test. And in this group of patients, you should consider steroids. Um, steroids obviously helps by reducing the amount of edema in the trachea, and it's recommended that you should give patients steroids if they previously failed extubation or if they failed a cuff leak test, and you should give, them, give it for a minimum of four hours before you reassess the situation. There's no consensus of dose in the literature, um, the use of about 20 milligrams of methylprednisolone is often reported. Um, and and in, when you're using methylpred, the recommendation is for four doses over 12 hours. And this is associated with a reduction in post extubation stridor and a reduction in the need for reintubation. Clinically, we use beta methazone here or, or dexamethazone in our ICU. And we use four milligrams and give four doses in 24 hours. And then we reassess after 24 hours rather than just four hours. Okay, other bits and bobs that are of interest and relevance when you're assessing the, the um, ability to liberate from mechanical ventilation. What about the aspiration risk of the patient? As I mentioned earlier, you should be stopping your um, nasogastric feeds for at least four hours, um, I think for at least four hours before um, extubation. And the, the recommendation is that to continue nil per os orders for more than four hours post extubation. This, the reason for delaying um, recommencing feeds or oral intake is because of, of laryngeal sensation, which, which is likely to be abnormal for up to four to eight hours post extubation. Even in 
for patients who are ventilated for as little as eight hours. The vocal cord closure can be um, impaired for about 24 hours in about a third of patients who've been intubated for more than six days. And some patients, remember, will have um, quite severe impairment and actually may have vocal cord um, damage. What about hemodynamic stability? I mentioned a little bit about this earlier. It's not a, an absolute that the patient must not be receiving vasoactive substances before you perform a spontaneous breathing trial or before you liberate from mechanical ventilation. However, they must be fully resuscitated and have a normal lactate and warm peripheries and that the inotropes or vasos, vasopressors should be at low or decreasing doses. Don't, even if the patient's got single organ failure with very high inotrope requirements, it's not prudent to extubate a patient on high dose inotropes, but low dose vasoactive agents shouldn't prevent extubation. Okay, so what if the patient fails to wean from mechanical ventilation? Well, this can either be because of, pa be because of patient factors or clinician factors. And the patient factors may be because of persistence of the disease process, or quite commonly, maybe because of fluid overload and particular cardiac failure. And I just want to just digress and say a little bit about the importance of fluid balance and cardiac function. So fluid in the heart, the one thing when you have a patient who is, has cardiac failure or fluid overload is that positive pressure ventilation is your friend. An increase in intrathoracic pressure increase, reduces your preload because it reduces your venous return and it also reduces afterload, so it helps offload the heart. So if you have a patient who has borderline cardiac failure uh, or, or a poor cardiac function, um, that you may think that the patient is actually doing extremely well and is ready to be liberated off the ventilator, but the very fact that they're getting positive pressure ventilation may artificially improve the situation. So, um, preload is, re is reduced, uh, I beg your pardon, uh, uh, preload is affected by intrathoracic pressure. So when you're getting positive pressure ventilation, you increase your intrathoracic pressure, which then reduces the venous return to the right heart. And because the ventricles are in series, it reduces the venous return to the left side of the heart also. Afterload is also improved by positive pressure ventilation because positive pressure ventilation increases intrapleural pressure, which reduces the transmural pressure across the, the, um, the ventricle. And remember, it's that your transmural pressure is what de determines your left ventricular afterload. So positive pressure ventilation also improves afterload. So what you don't want is you want a patient to, to um, when you remove the positive pressure ventilation, is to have a sudden increase in, in preload and a sudden increase in afterload, and then they develop pulmonary edema. So patients with a poor LV may fail extubation, despite looking comfortable on a spontaneous breathing trial. And in these patients with a poor LV and some degree of fluid overload, you might want to consider extubating them straight to non-invasive ventilation. And because this will still give them some degree of positive pressure ventilation, some degree of um, assistance in reduction in preload and, and augmentation of afterload, um, and working on reducing afterload. And then you can consider the use of um, pharmacotherapy with inodilators, for example, to consider further using afterload, um, further reducing your afterload, and then gradually weaning your non-invasive ventilation further. So the other important thing with fluids is that reintubation definitely um, correlates with a fluid balance. So ideally, when you're looking at a patient for liberation from mechanical ventilation, it's great if they're in a negative, um, if a negative fluid balance, because patients who are in a positive fluid balance may still fail, a sponta uh, fail extubation despite passing a spontaneous breathing trial. And another quote from John, Rep, John Cress is that diuresis and weaning go hand in hand. So clinician factors may also impede the failure to liberate from mechanical ventilation. That's when we get it wrong with um, underloading and overloading the respiratory muscles. And this is mostly to do with when we stuff up when we're setting the ventilator. So abnormal loading of respiratory muscles. So overloading the respiratory muscles is very easy to detect. And it's usually when we've set the ventilator inadequately, the patient fights the ventilator um, they get a large degree of patient ventilator dyssynchrony and 
This fighting the ventilator can actually damage sarcomeres of the muscles and lead to muscle fatigue. So it's very often easy to see this. However, underloading, um, underloading the patient on mechanical ventilation is often missed. What I mean by underloading the, the respiratory muscles is when we overcompensate for the patient. So we don't allow the patient to take any breaths on their own or to trigger the ventilator at all. The patient looks incredibly comfortable because they're not doing anything. So the patient does absolutely nothing and the ventilator does all the work. Overloading muscles can also occur when you perform a spontaneous breathing trial on the patient. And the bottom line is don't flog them to death. You don't want the patient to fail the spontaneous breathing trial by becoming very tachypneic and exhausted because this can also cause muscle fatigue. Don't allow the patient to become desynchronous on the ventilator. Again, when they start to fight and become desynchronous, you damage sarcomeres, you get muscle fatigue and you get further setback. So you must not allow the patient to fatigue on the ventilator. Again, underloading with, um, where the patient does absolutely nothing is a big problem because you can get what we call ventilate, vid or ventilator uh, ventilator-induced diaphragmatic dysfunction. And when the patient is on full ventilatory support, particularly if they're deeply sedated or have muscle relaxants on board, then they get very little stimulation with diaphragm and they can actually in, um, develop diaphragmatic atrophy where it becomes a very long protracted um, course on the, um, on, the, on the mechanical ventilator. Okay, so both are disastrous. You want to hit the sweet spot. You don't want to overload your patient's respiratory muscles and you want to make them do some work so they um, get some degree of diaphragmatic and, and um, inspiratory muscle training. Okay, other bits and bobs that I'm not really going to go into very much, but patients with prolonged mechanical ventilation, yes, there are different, way, there are different ways in which we should be thinking about weaning these patients, particularly if they've got an endo, um, a tracheostomy in situ. Um, with the use of non-invasive ventilation, the use of extubation to high flow nasal cannula and measures to predict, predict successful liberation. I'm not going to go through all this. Um, I do have a set of lecture notes that if you e want to email me, I can make them available to you, which do expand on, on these four points. But just a little bit to say about non-invasive ventilation in, in, um, when we're using it, when we extubate a patient. Okay, so non-invasive ventilation can be used in three ways when you're thinking about extubating patients in the ICU. The first is to facilitate early extubation. The second is to use prophylactic non-invasive ventilation. And the third is to use rescue non-invasive ventilation. And what I want to mean, what I, I just want to explain what I mean by these three scenarios. Facilitating early extubation and putting the patient straight onto non-invasive ventilation is sometimes used when the patient's not quite ready to come off mechanical ventilation. The idea is that you're trying to reduce the risk of positive pressure ventilation or high dose, higher settings of positive pressure ventilation and trying to reduce the risk of, um, of, laryngeal, of, of translaryngeal um, um, intubation. So it's often used or occasionally used in patients with COPD that, and those who are deemed to have a high chance of reintubation. And what we do in these patients is we, we extubate them straight away to non-invasive ventilation when they don't quite meet full extubation criteria. And this is, has been associated with a reduction in mortality, reduction in ventilator-associated pneumonia, and a reduction in ICU and hospital length of stay. But you really have to choose your patients carefully. It's not something where you go rogue and do this on all patients. It should be done with careful consideration and probably with the input of an expert. Don't do it, um, just really pick your patient very carefully. Prophylactic non-invasive non ventilation is a little bit different. It's, or the terminology is for a slightly different group of patients, those patients who are at high risk for intubation. And the idea with prophylactic non-invasive ventilation is you extubate them again straight to non-invasive ventilation. Don't wait until trouble comes after they've been already extubated. And this group of patients who respond particularly well to prophylactic NIV is particularly those patients with poor left ventricular function who are at high risk of going back into pulmonary edema and as I mentioned already, positive pressure ventilation, even with just non-invasive ventilation, augments your preload and afterload. And then finally, what about rescue non-invasive ventilation? Now, we see this time and time and again in the ward where um, some of the, the, the wards outside of the ICU will call to the ICU to ask for a non-invasive ventilator. 
patients might have low bar collapse or they've got atelectasis in, in the ward and they're just not coping. So these patients just get bunged on non-invasive ventilation. Um, and they tend to, they've either, they've either already failed or are failing extubation, or they, or they are trying to tide the patient over to avoid either reintubation or intubation from the first. And rescue non-invasive ventilation to try to avoid reintubation re re is a bad idea. The Esteban study, a more recent Esteban study from 2005, showed that patients who were bunged on rescue non-invasive ventilation had a far higher mortality than those who were just intubated um, when trouble um, when trouble occurred uh, or before trouble occurred. Um, the, the mortality rate in those patients who got rescue NIV was 25% compared to those who were intubated with a, a mortality of 14%. And the question is why? Why rescue NIV fails? And the bottom line is the reason it fails is because you're flogging a dead horse. You're pushing on and on and on with the patient trying to stop them from being intubated. Um, and unfortunately what happens is the patient deteriorates and deteriorates, and then they need an emergent intubation, which is associated with a high risk of mortality. So in summary, in summary when you're trying to um, liberate patients from mechanical ventilation, we want to talk about liberation, not weaning. Don't overdo ventilation by letting the patient do absolutely nothing because they're just gonna become weak and it's going to increase their time on a ventilator. But similarly, don't overdo ventilation, I mean, underdo ventilation, as in make sure the patient has sufficient support and that they don't have patient ventilator dyssynchrony. Know your ABC and use it. It's important to um, allow the patient to have a daily awakening as well as a daily spontaneous breathing trial in most cases. Use a spontaneous breathing trial for 30 minutes to 120 minutes. Don't allow the patient to get tired though, but use them on a, and the best way to perform a spontaneous breathing trial is on the ventilator with a low PEEP and low pressure support rather than TPs and use your rapid shallow breathing index. It's a good tool to, pre to predict extubation success. Be aware of patients with a poor cough, secretions, rising temperature and a positive fluid balance, but don't be scared of a little bit of vasopressor. And consider the need for extubation to non-invasive ventilation and consider the risk of post-extubation stridor. And in these group of patients, maybe consider the use of, of um, steroids. And that's all, folks. Thank you very much.